Today on The King is Coming, Dr. Heinsohn speaks at Shadow Mountain Church on why the name of Jesus is so important. I want us to focus this morning on the name of the Lord Himself. Uh, Take your Bible this morning and find the book of Acts. Go to chapter 4. Now, let me set the background for just a moment. Uh, In the book of Acts, the Spirit of God comes on the early Christians on the day of Pentecost. They begin to preach the Word of God with faith and confidence and boldness that Jesus has died for our sins and He has risen from the dead. He's a risen Savior. He's alive today. And on that first day, Peter preaches the sermon and 3,000 people are converted in one day. And then you move to the second event in the book. By the time you come to chapter 3 of Acts, uh, Peter and John go up to the temple. Uh, There's a beggar sitting there who has been crippled from birth, uh, and they don't have any money. Uh, And Peter looks at him and says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I'll give to you in the name of of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible tells us the man got up, and all of a sudden, miraculously, instantaneously, he begins to run and leap and jump. Now, many of you know that four years ago, I spent three months in the hospital. Uh, You lay there dormant for a couple of months, you don't get up and jump. The first time they stood me up, I was like jello. It took three people to get me up. I had to learn to stand, I had to learn to walk, I had to learn to uh, eat uh, all over again. But the miracle of God in this case was so thorough, so powerful, the man who had never walked jumps up, he runs into the temple, and he's so excited, he's leaping and praising and shouting and thanking God for what he has done. Uh, Now, I know that sounds strange to Baptists, uh, but uh, that actually was occurring uh, in the Bible. Uh, If you'd been healed uh, that dramatically, you'd be leaping and shouting and praising God as well. Uh, it, It would just be an automatic response. The problem is he draws a lot of attention. He draws a crowd, and Peter decides... Another opportunity to preach another sermon. And so he preaches again and says, if you're wondering what happened to this guy, it was in the name of Jesus that he was healed. Uh, And 5,000 people believe. Uh, And Luke, as he writes the book of Acts, keeps counting the numbers in a positive fashion to say the Word of God was going forth with power. God was building the church in fulfillment of Jesus' prediction that He would build the church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The problem was they gained such attention that eventually the temple guards came in and arrested them and put them in jail overnight. The next morning, they're going to be brought to trial before the high priest. What in the world did you think you were doing? Uh, Take your Bible. Go to Acts, the fourth chapter. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people, uh, and they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized them. Because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. Now look at verse 3. It says, And the next day the rulers and the elders and the teachers met in Jerusalem, uh, Annas and Caiaphas, etc. They begin to question them. Uh, You have a process uh, that follows here of their arrest, the accusation that is brought against them, and then the affirmation of their faith that follows one after another. And finally, the high priest said to them, by what power, what authority, or what name have you done this? In other words, who do you think you are running around in the temple of God, making such a declaration, making such a claim, causing such a disturbance? Uh, Who gave you this authority? In what name have you done this? That was the wrong question. Uh, And uh, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 8, said, 
rulers and elders of the people. If you want to be known today, uh, the account of how this crippled man was healed, then let it be known to all of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that God has done this. And then he said to them in verse 12, I want to tell you, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The issue of salvation is not a a question in the Bible of, well, I, I hope eventually I'll make it to heaven. If somebody were to ask you, if you were to die today, uh, do you have the confidence that you'd go to heaven? The wrong answer is, I hope so. Uh, uh, The wrong answer is, I'm doing the best I can, and yet that's the answer the average American typically gives. Well, I'm as good as the next guy. The problem is the next guy's not good enough, Uh, and uh, neither are we, Uh, that it's not our good deeds that get us to heaven. It's the great deed of Jesus Christ who went to the cross, took our sins upon himself, died in our place, and rose from the dead. That was the message of the early apostles. That has been the driving message of the real gospel of Jesus Christ throughout all the years of church history, that there is salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. Boy, you talk about saying something politically incorrect. Uh, They'd have got boycotted. Uh, They'd have been on MSNBC. Uh, Somebody would have been upset with these guys. Uh, They'd have been after them. Bill Maher would have had a field day uh, with that kind of a thing. Uh, How do you think you are uh, making such a declaration? So the question we want to raise then is, what is so important about that name, uh, about the name of the Lord? The very phrase, name of the Lord, appears over a hundred times in the Old Testament. Uh, When we read the Old Testament, the name of the Lord, when it appears in your Bible in all capital letters, always translates the divine name, Jehovah. Uh, In Hebrew, uh, you would pronounce it Yahweh. Uh, It's the God who is the existent one, the God of all being the God who always was and is and always will be. So when you're reading your Bible in English and there's a capital L and lowercase o-r-d, it's a different word. It's Lord, but it's Lord and Master, Adonai. When it's all four capital letters, L-O-R-D, all caps, it's the Lord Jehovah. Now, in Hebrew, there's technically no J, so they pronounce it Yahweh, but it's the divine name. In the New Testament, the name of the Savior in English is Jesus. In the Greek language, there's also no J, so it's Jesus. Uh, It's the same name. In the Hebrew, it's Yeshua. Uh, Jesus is Yeshua or Yehoshua. It's similar to Joshua, uh, and it means Savior deliverer. He is the divine one who is the Son of God who comes into human flesh to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament, Uh, that He's the one who is the seed of the woman, the son of Abraham, the son of Isaac, etc. He's the God who steps into sandals, God in a robe, God on foot, who comes to live among us so He can lift us up uh, out of our difficulties, out of our failures, out of our sin, and give us grace and forgiveness and power and transformation. Today, we have a special offer from the King is Coming telecast. Dr. Heinsohn's End Times Video Library, a collection of 15 DVD series in two attractive storage binders, includes topics like Angels and Demons in the Last Days, Final Signs, Global Warning, The Battle for Israel, Jerusalem in Prophecy, The Coming Middle East Crisis, Armageddon, End Times Wars, plus seven more. With a total of 50 powerful messages, this is an amazing offer. Normally, we ask $20 for each DVD. That would be a total of $300. So for your gift of just $100 to help us take the message of Jesus around the world, you'll save a startling $200. Why, that's two-thirds off. Make your gift of $100 or more payable to The King is Coming, Box 907, Colton, California, 92324. To use your credit card, call 800-622-2767 or go to thekingiscoming.com.
When the Jewish people would read the Old Testament, and still to this day, when they come to the divine name, they won't pronounce it. They'll simply read the words in Hebrew, Ha-Shem, the name, the sacred name, the name that is never pronounced. That helps us understand the incident that occurred with Moses in the Old Testament. Remember, Moses had killed the Egyptian. He'd fled into the wilderness. Uh, He feels forsaken and abandoned. He's been there for 40 years. He's on the backside of the desert. He sees the bush on fire, goes to see what this is all about. And the Bible says, the angel of the Lord, Christ Himself in the Old Testament. I give you a whole list of that in the book. Every time the angel of the Lord appears, the Lord appears, God speaks. It's obvious this is not an ordinary angel. This is God Himself. God speaks to him from the bush and tells him, Moses, I know that my people, the children of Israel, are in bondage and slavery in Egypt. I have heard their cries. I have seen their misery. I am concerned. Therefore, I have come down. In the Old Testament, God is not an impersonal force. God is a personal being. He is a God of love and grace and mercy and compassion. He sees us in all of the challenges of life. He hears our cries. He is concerned. And in every appropriate moment, God comes down to meet our need. Think back to the very beginning. When Adam and Eve had sinned against God, they felt guilty. They ran and hid in the bushes. God came into the garden to speak to them. They didn't have a Bible to go by. God had to appear to them in personal presence. But when He came into the garden after their sin, He did not come making accusations. God comes asking a series of questions, almost like a parent. Adam, earth man, dirt ball, where are you? Adam's response, no, we're over here in the trees. Uh, Why? What have you done? You ever ask your kids that question? Where have you been? Their favorite answer, nowhere. Uh, That's a lie. Uh, What have you been doing? Nothing. That's another lie. Uh, Whatever. Adam, what have you done? And with all the male leadership he could muster, he said, it's the woman you gave me. Uh, And blame Eve and God uh, for the whole thing. And when God said to Eve, what have you done? She said, well, the serpent made me do it. Times change. Human nature does not. When we fail, what do we want to do? Blame God, blame the devil, or blame somebody else. Uh, It's never my fault. The most difficult challenge in human nature is to say, I did it. I'm guilty. I'm wrong. I'm a sinner. That's why I need a Savior. That's why I need forgiveness. I take responsibility for it. And yet notice what happened in that story. God did not say to them, all right, you guys blew it. Come on up to heaven and stand before the judgment bar. He didn't do that. God came down to the fallen place, to the sinful place, to the moment of their failure. God comes into the garden, slays the first animals, sheds the first blood, makes the first sacrifice, covers their inadequacy, and gives them the first prophecy of the Bible that the seed of the woman, a human being, somebody will come into the human race who will ultimately crush the head of the serpent. Now, God does not always remain remote. God comes down in the moment of our crisis. The children of Israel in Moses' day had been in bondage for years. They're crying out to God for deliverance. So God appears to Moses and says to him, I've come down to release my people. Moses is thinking, great, it's about time. And therefore, I want you to go to Pharaoh and you tell him, let my people go. What did Moses do? Started making a whole bunch of excuses. No, you got the wrong guy, not me. Uh, They don't like me back there uh, in Egypt. This is probably not a good idea. God is thinking, no, this is a very good idea. You know the Egyptian language. You know Egyptian culture. You were raised in the palace. You know how to get an audience with the king. No, this is a real good idea. And I finally waited long enough that you're humble enough and broken enough so that I can use you powerfully. You're the man. And finally, Moses said, look, I don't even know your name. Your name is so sacred. If I go back to the Israelites and say, 
God has appeared to me and told me to lead you out of bondage. They're going to say, what's his name? And I'm going to say, I I don't know. I don't even know how to speak your name. And God spoke to him from the bush and said what? Moses, I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. I am the God who has always existed. The very declaration is itself a part of that name Yahweh, uh, the divine name, the sacred name of the Old Testament, the God who always was, who always is, and who always will be, who has no beginning and no ending, the self-existent one, the one who spoke the world into existence, I am God. Tell them, I am sent you. Now, fast forward ahead from the Old Testament to the connection to the New Testament. Jesus is preaching, John chapter 8. He's challenged. Who do you think you are? Do you think you're greater than our forefather, our ancestor, Abraham? And Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. What did he mean by that? That God had given Abraham the prophetic insight to realize one day a Savior would come, a Messiah would come through Abraham's line. Uh, The audience responds, uh, Abraham's been dead for hundreds of years. You're not even 50 years old. How in the world could Abraham have seen your day? And Jesus gives this unusual response, John 8, 58. He said, before Abraham was, I what? I am. He takes the sacred name of God and applies it to himself. He didn't say, before Abraham was, I was. He says, before Abraham was, before Abraham existed, I am. And he connects his identity to the identity of the God of the Old Testament. Oh, they understood what he was saying. They picked up stones. They wanted to stone him for claiming to be God. Don't ever fall for the idea that Jesus never claimed to be God. Uh, You hear this on the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, and whatever, uh, that uh, some so-called expert gets on there and says, Jesus was just a simple, humble rabbi. Uh, The church came along centuries later uh, and deified him, kind of the Da Vinci Code thesis. Uh, Really? Well, then why did Jesus say, if you have seen me, you have seen God? Today, we have a special offer from The King is Coming telecast. Dr. Heinsohn's End Times Video Library, a collection of 15 DVD series in two attractive storage binders, includes topics like angels and demons in the last days, final signs, global warning, the battle for Israel, Jerusalem in prophecy, the coming Middle East crisis, Armageddon, End Times Wars, plus seven more. With a total of 50 powerful messages, this is an amazing offer. Normally, we ask $20 for each DVD. That would be a total of $300. So for your gift of just $100 to help us take the message of Jesus around the world, you'll save a startling $200. Why, that's two-thirds off. Make your gift of $100 or more payable to The King is Coming, Box 907, Colton, California, 92324. To use your credit card, call 800-622-2767 or go to thekingiscoming.com. Why did he say, I and the Father are one? Why did he say that he had the power to forgive our sins? His own audience challenged him and said, only God can forgive sins. That was the whole point. No, Jesus shouts to you uh, that he is God. Jesus declares his divinity and his deity time and time again, even at his trial before the high priest. When he is asked, are you the son of the blessed one, the son of God? His answer is, yes, thou hast said. Uh, No, Jesus tells you very clearly who he is, and John 8, 58 is one of those examples. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the one who is the ground of all being. I am the divine one. I am the Savior. I am the promised one. God comes down in the incarnation of Christ. God comes down in human form, one who is fully human and yet fully divine at the same time. And that cry goes throughout the entire pages of the Old Testament. I think back to the days of Isaiah the prophet. A godly king has just died, and an ungodly king is about to come to the throne. Isaiah is concerned about the future. 
uh, the political uh, parameters don't look very hopeful. Uh, the tough passage in a political election year. Uh, and uh, uh, he's worried about what's going to happen, who the next king is going to be, and the next king was ungodly. The next king was a failure. Uh, and Isaiah the prophet senses that. Uh, and, and he's wondering, God, where are you in all of this? And remember that story in Isaiah 6? All of a sudden he sees a vision of God on the throne. He saw the Lord seated on the throne. God was reminding him, I'm the king. I'm on the throne. I'm in control. Human leaders come and go. You need to understand, Isaiah, I'm the one that's really in charge. He sees the Lord high and lifted up. He sees the glory of God filling the throne of heaven and the temple of heaven. And then he hears the voice of God say, whom shall I send to this generation? Who will go for us? A reference, obviously, to the Trinity. It's not God and the angels sending. The angels do not send. They are themselves sent. It is God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit speaking. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah the prophet gives a very simple one-word response, hineni, in the Hebrew text. Here am I. It's me. Send me. I I'll go. Uh, biblical critics have long tried to say that, well, you know, the book of Isaiah starts out in the opening half of the book with an emphasis on judgment. But the second half of the book is on comfort and blessing. Uh, the first half of the book is kind of, you're going to get it. Uh, the second half of the book is, but God is good uh, all the time, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, how do you balance the two? And the solution of liberal scholars is, well, there must have been two guys that wrote this, uh, a first Isaiah and a second Isaiah, Deutero-Isaiah. Maybe there were three Isaiahs, Trito-Isaiah. I even have a liberal commentary that says there were a dozen different guys that wrote this stuff, uh, and Isaiah didn't write any of it. Uh, they just throw the whole thing out the window. No, there are all kinds of things that connect the first half of the book to the second half of the book to convince us that the same guy wrote the entire book. In fact, Jesus himself quoted from both halves of the book and attributed both halves to Isaiah the prophet. Uh, one of those little things that is often overlooked is that little word, hineni. Here am I. God said, I am that I am. Tell them that I am sent you. The prophet said, here am I, send me. And God commissions Isaiah to go and preach. Uh, and God used him powerfully to influence later a godly king, Hezekiah, to spare the city of Jerusalem from destruction and from attack. But like any prophet, Isaiah wonders, God, where are you? Oh, that you would rend the heavens, he says, as he builds a crescendo of prophecies at the end of that book about the power of the coming Messiah. Oh, that you would rip heaven open, that you would come down. God, when are you going to come down? When are you going to straighten out this mess? When are you going to deal with people? Uh, my students will sometimes say that. I'm praying for my roommate. Good. Yeah, and he got saved. Good. No, I meant kill him, not save him. Uh, he's from Chicago. Uh, I'm from Alabama. Uh, we don't even think alike. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't get what we think we want. God comes down when we need him the most. Isaiah 58, 9, you get the connection. First half of the book, chapter 6, Hineni, here I am, send me. Isaiah 58, 9, you will call and the Lord, all caps, Jehovah, will answer, here I am. And it's that same word, hineni. You were willing to go and let me send you, Isaiah. I am willing to come and deliver you. Here I am. I am the great I am. I will come down. How does he come down? In the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not just a rabbi, a teacher, a prophet, a thinker. Jesus is God incarnate in human flesh. When he goes to the cross to die for our sins, he does not die the death of a martyr or the death of a victim. Jesus stands up on the nails, pulls himself up on the spikes, and when he shouts, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because God takes our sin, places it upon his son, and puts him to death 
in our behalf. Jesus dies as an atoning sacrifice. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who fulfills all the pictures and types and prophecies of the Old Testament in Himself, in the person of Jesus Christ, the sinless God becomes our sacrifice on the cross, and He who knew no sin is made sin for us. He dies in our place. It is no wonder, as the prophet Isaiah looked down through the halls of history, down through the corridor of time, he said, I see him. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's the mighty God. He's the El Gibor. He's God himself. He's the Prince of Peace, the Shar Shalom. He's the suffering servant who is crushed with the weight of our sins, and yet he is the coming king. He's the one who will rend the heavens, who will come down to meet our needs. God came down in the garden. God came down at the bush. God comes down throughout history, and God comes down on the cross. He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He dies for our sins. He provides the penalty. He pays the penalty. He provides salvation and redemption and forgiveness. He displays grace. That's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. You want to know what God is like? God is like Jesus. God is full of love and grace and compassion and mercy and yet confidence, and God is one who speaks to us in the depth of our need. No wonder those disciples, they knew who He was. If anybody should have said, oh, Jesus, He's not God. We traveled with Him for three years. Are you kidding? No, His disciples are convinced that He is God. Yeah, the guy walks on water. Uh, he can raise the dead. He can give sight to the blind. He lives a sinless life. He rose from the dead, and they give testimony to that fact, even to the point that they're willing to give their lives for their confidence in who He is. No wonder they said, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. It comes only through Him because He's the only sinless one. He's the only divine one that went to the cross to die in our place. Why is His name above all names? Well, first of all, because God, He said, I have explained my name. Uh, Exodus 34, 5 says, Now the Lord descended in a cloud and stood before Moses, and He proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before Him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. That's who He is. Secondly, God has exalted His name. It's exalted throughout the pages of the Old Testament. It's exalted in the person of Jesus in the pages of the New Testament. Due to the shortness of time, we aren't able to squeeze Dr. Heinsohn's entire message into the half hour we're allotted on this station. So be sure to tune in next week for the exciting conclusion to Dr. Heinsohn's message. If you'd like a copy of this message, it's available in your choice of CD for a gift of $10 or more and DVD for a gift of $20 or more. Make your gift payable to The King is Coming, Box 907, Colton, California. To use your credit card, call 800-622-2767 or go to thekingiscoming.com. Last week on The King is Coming, Dr. Heinsohn began a message titled, Why is the Name of Jesus So Important? In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible tells us the man got up. And all of a sudden, miraculously, instantaneously, he begins to run and leap and jump. He runs into the temple, and he's so excited, he's leaping and praising and shouting and thanking God for what he has done. Uh, now, I know that sounds strange to Baptists, uh, but uh, that actually was occurring uh, in the Bible. Uh, if you'd been healed uh, that dramatically, you'd be leaping and shouting and praising God as well. Uh, it, it would just be an automatic response. The problem is he draws a lot of attention. He draws a crowd. Uh, and Peter decides, 
Another opportunity to preach another sermon. And so he preaches again and says, if you're wondering what happened to this guy, it was in the name of Jesus that he was healed. Take your Bible. Go to Acts, the fourth chapter. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people, uh, and they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized them. Because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. Now look at verse 3. It says, and the next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers met in Jerusalem. Uh, Annas and Caiaphas, etc. They begin to question them. Uh, you have a process uh, that follows here of their arrest, the accusation that is brought against them, and then the affirmation of their faith that follows one after another. And finally, the high priest said to them, by what power, what authority, or what name have you done this? In other words, who do you think you are running around in the temple of God, making such a declaration, making such a claim, causing such a disturbance? Uh, who gave you this authority? In what name have you done this? That was the wrong question. Uh, and uh, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 8, said, Rulers and elders of the people, if you want to be known today uh, the account of how this crippled man was healed, then let it be known to all of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that God has done this. And then he said to them in verse 12, I want to tell you, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The children of Israel in Moses' day had been in bondage for years. They're crying out to God for deliverance. So God appears to Moses and says to him, I've come down to release my people. Moses is thinking, great, it's about time. And therefore, I want you to go to Pharaoh and you tell him, let my people go. What did Moses do? Started making a whole bunch of excuses. No, you got the wrong guy, not me. Uh, you know, they don't like me back there uh, in Egypt. This is probably not a good idea. God is thinking, no, this is a very good idea. You know the Egyptian language. You know Egyptian culture. You were raised in the palace. You know how to get an audience with the king. No, this is a real good idea. And I finally waited long enough that you're humble enough and broken enough so that I can use you powerfully. You're the man. And finally, Moses said, look, I don't even know your name. Your name is so sacred. If I go back to the Israelites and say, God has appeared to me and told me to lead you out of bondage, they're going to say, what's his name? And I'm going to say, I, I don't know. I don't even know how to speak your name. And God spoke to him from the bush and said what? Moses, I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. I am the God who has always existed. The very declaration is itself a part of that name, Yahweh, uh, the divine name, the sacred name of the Old Testament, the God who always was, who always is, and who always will be, who has no beginning and no ending, the self-existent one, the one who spoke the world into existence, I am God. Tell them, I am sent you. Now, fast forward ahead from the Old Testament to the connection to the New Testament. Jesus is preaching, John chapter 8. He's challenged. Who do you think you are? Do you think you're greater than our forefather, our ancestor, Abraham? And Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. What did he mean by that? That God had given Abraham the prophetic insight to realize one day a Savior would come, a Messiah would come through Abraham's line. Uh, the audience responds, uh, Abraham's been dead for hundreds of years. You're not even 50 years old. How in the world could Abraham have seen your day? And Jesus gives this unusual response, John 8, 58. He said, before Abraham was, I what? I am. He takes the sacred name of God and applies it to himself. 
He didn't say, before Abraham was, I was. He says, before Abraham was, before Abraham existed, I am. And he connects his identity to the identity of the God of the Old Testament. Oh, they understood what he was saying. They picked up stones. They wanted to stone him for claiming to be God. Don't ever fall for the idea that Jesus never claimed to be God. Uh, You hear this on the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, and whatever, uh, that uh, some so-called expert gets on there and says, Jesus was just a simple, humble rabbi. Uh, The church came along centuries later uh, and deified him, kind of the Da Vinci Code thesis. Uh, Really? Well, then why did Jesus say, if you have seen me, you have seen God? Why did he say, I and the Father are one? Why did he say that he had the power to forgive our sins? His own audience challenged him and said, only God can forgive sins. That was the whole point. No, Jesus shouts to you uh, that he is God. Jesus declares his divinity and his deity time and time again, even at his trial before the high priest. When he is asked, are you the son of the blessed one, the son of God? His answer is, yes, thou hast said the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who fulfills all the pictures and types and prophecies of the Old Testament in Himself, in the person of Jesus Christ, the sinless God becomes our sacrifice on the cross, and He who knew no sin is made sin for us. He dies in our place. It is no wonder, as the prophet Isaiah looked down through the halls of history, down through the corridor of time, he said, I see him. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's the mighty God. He's the El Gibor. He's God himself. He's the Prince of Peace, the Shar Shalom. He's the suffering servant who is crushed with the weight of our sins, and yet he is the coming king. He's the one who will rend the heavens, who will come down to meet our needs. God came down in the garden. God came down at the bush. God comes down throughout history, and God comes down on the cross. He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He dies for our sins. He provides the penalty. He pays the penalty. He provides salvation and redemption and forgiveness. He displays grace. That's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. You want to know what God is like? God is like Jesus. God is full of love and grace and compassion and mercy and yet confidence, and God is one who speaks to us in the depth of our need. No wonder those disciples, they knew who He was. If anybody should have said, oh, Jesus, He's not God. We traveled with Him for three years. Are you kidding? No, His disciples are convinced that He is God. Yeah, the guy walks on water. Uh, He can raise the dead. He can give sight to the blind. He lives a sinless life. He rose from the dead, and they give testimony to that fact, even to the point that they're willing to give their lives for their confidence in who He is. No wonder, they said, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Today, he concludes his powerful, life-changing message, Why is the name of Jesus so important? Why is his name above all names? Well, first of all, because God, he said, I have explained my name. Uh, Exodus 34, 5 says, Now the Lord descended in a cloud and stood before Moses, and he proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. That's who He is. Secondly, God has exalted His name. It's exalted throughout the pages of the Old Testament. It's exalted in the person of Jesus in the pages of the New Testament. Philippians 2, therefore God has highly exalted Him and given Him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those in earth and those under the earth. Uh, And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the name that is above every name. Uh, And then it's the name that God extends salvation through, and it's the only name. Hence our original text, Acts 4.12. Now there is salvation in no other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
But in our postmodern, overly politically correct culture, uh, we're not used to hearing that in public discourse. What do you mean you think Jesus is the only answer? Poor Dan Cathy with Chick-fil-A uh, just simply is asked, do you believe Jesus is the way to heaven? Yes. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, the mayor of Boston said we're going to boycott his restaurant. Uh, he thinks Jesus is the only way. Well, now, wait a minute. If you're going to be consistent, you're going to boycott every Muslim-owned restaurant in Boston uh, where the owner thinks uh, Muhammad and Allah are the only way? Now, not all Muslims believe that, but a lot of them do. You're going to boycott every Roman Catholic restaurant uh, owner uh, who believes salvation only comes uh, through submission to the Pope and the sacraments? Not every Roman Catholic believes that, but a lot of them do. You're going to boycott every Jewish restaurant uh, that believes Jesus is not the Messiah because they think they've got the only way to heaven? Are you going to be consistent or are you just going to boycott evangelicals uh, who think Jesus is the answer? Uh, there is absolutely no consistency in our culture. Now, I can respect other religious beliefs for what they believe. I don't agree, but I can respect a Muslim who says, I think this is the way it is. I don't agree. I think he's wrong, but I respect that. Or a person of another denomination or another faith. I respect their belief system if they think it's really of God uh, and they stand for it consistently. But in our culture, you can say you believe in anything except Jesus and it's okay. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, uh, the attitude is if you stand up for the God of the Bible, oh, that's a terrible thing. Why? Because Satan doesn't care what everybody else thinks. He only cares what God thinks. He only opposes that which God opposes. Today, we have a special offer from the King is Coming telecast. Dr. Heinsohn's End Times Video Library, a collection of 15 DVD series in two attractive storage binders, includes topics like angels and demons in the last days, final signs, global warning, the battle for Israel, Jerusalem in prophecy, the coming Middle East crisis, Armageddon, End Times Wars, plus seven more. With a total of 50 powerful messages, this is an amazing offer. Normally, we ask $20 for each DVD. That would be a total of $300. So for your gift of just $100 to help us take the message of Jesus around the world, you'll save a startling $200. Why, that's two-thirds off. Make your gift of $100 or more payable to The King is Coming, Box 907, Colton, California, 92324. To use your credit card, call 800-622-2767 or go to thekingiscoming.com. Liberty University, as you know, was founded by Jerry Falwell Sr. Uh, and in his heyday as a preacher, Jerry would always wear a black suit and a red tie, and he had a little Jesus first pin. Uh, and uh, he gave those away by the, literally by the millions. If you write in, you could get a free Jesus first pin. Uh, and uh, so he always wore the Jesus first pin. We used to jokingly say, Jerry wears the thing to bed on his pajamas at night, uh, whatever. But I remember an incident in the 1980s uh, when he was defending the nation and people of Israel. Uh, and uh, Menachem Begin, then the Prime Minister of Israel, asked to meet him personally at the Blair House in Washington, D.C. Several of us went with him to that meeting. And there he was, typical as always, the black suit, the red tie, the Jesus first pet. One of our own staff members got him aside and said, Jerry, you're going to meet with Jewish leaders. Maybe you ought to take the Jesus first pin off. Maybe that's not a good idea. And I remember he looked at this guy like, I can't believe you said that. He said, no, where I go, Jesus goes. They take me, they take Jesus. That's just the way it is. You don't build the world's largest Christian university by waffling around on things. There are too many guys today, when they get an opportunity to be interviewed by the news, they back down like they think that's going to make it more acceptable, more palatable. Do you think Je they're always going to ask you, do you think Jesus is the only way to heaven? Well, maybe, kind of, sort of, I don't know, yeah, like, well, you know, God loves everybody. Eh. Uh, isn't that good? No, that's not the right answer. The right answer is yes, Jesus is the only way. 
You may or may not believe that. I love you anyhow, no matter what. We don't have to be arrogant about it. We don't have to be obnoxious about it. We don't have to be hostile about it. But it's time to stand up for the truth, declare the truth, live the truth, be the truth, and make a difference in this culture. Why? Because we know it's the only thing that works. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. There was no Bible in our home. There was no talk about God. Nobody went to church. Uh, when uh, I was a kid, a, a church a lot like this one built a new building right near our house. Uh, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, in a blue-collar family. My parents dropped out of school in the eighth grade. My mother got a flyer in the mail that advertised vacation Bible school at the church. Uh, and she thought, great, it'll get him out of the house for a whole week, five days. That'd be a real good thing. Go to that. She didn't even take me. It was the 1950s. You didn't take kids, you sent them. Uh, you didn't coddle them. She just said, yeah, go there, down the street, make sure the light's green when you cross the road. Uh, don't get hit by a car. You'll be fine. Uh, go to that. That'll be good for you. I went there and heard that Jesus loved me, that He died for my sins, that He rose from the dead and that He was coming again, and that I could have forgiveness and salvation and a home in heaven, and it was all free. I thought, man, this is a great deal. I'm in. Uh, I raised my hand. I said, yes, I'll take that. Uh, I, I, the lady who dealt with me was so careful and thorough. I went home as a kid knowing I was saved, knowing that God had come to live within my life. My parents didn't get it. My mother said, well, honey, how was Bible school? Ma, uh, I met Jesus there. Yeah, that's nice. And I thought, no, you don't get it. I really did. Uh, it really is going to make a difference, and it's made all the difference. Now, later, my parents did finally come to faith. They finally got it. Uh, if you got it at some point in your life, you understand why we say there's salvation in no other name. Nobody else loves you like Jesus loves you. Nobody else died for you like He died for you. No other sinless person shed His blood on your behalf. Nobody else fulfilled the prophecies of the Bible like He did. It's all about Him. Today, we have a special offer from the King is Coming telecast. Dr. Heinsohn's End Times Video Library, a collection of 15 DVD series in two attractive storage binders, includes topics like angels and demons in the last days, final signs, global warning, the battle for Israel, Jerusalem in prophecy, the coming Middle East crisis, Armageddon, End Times Wars, plus seven more. With a total of 50 powerful messages, this is an amazing offer. Normally, we ask $20 for each DVD. That would be a total of $300. So for your gift of just $100 to help us take the message of Jesus around the world, you'll save a startling $200. Why, that's two-thirds off. Make your gift of $100 or more payable to The King is Coming, Box 907, Colton, California, 92324. To use your credit card, call 800-622-2767 or go to thekingiscoming.com. But let me take a further survey this morning. How many of you have been a born-again believer, a follower of the Lord for 20 years or more? Let me see your hands. That's a lot of hands. Now, let me give all of us, and I'm with you, some advice. Don't take that for granted. Don't just assume, yeah, I'm saved. Yeah, I'm on my way to heaven. I have to constantly ask myself, God, what do you want to do with the life that you saved? What difference do you want me to make now before I get to heaven? And I need to constantly thank you and praise you that I'm on my way to heaven. And, and stop just assuming that, but be grateful for the power of God that reaches us and changes us. If you've been saved in the last 10 years, or less than 20 years, or the last two weeks, or the last five years, you get it. You understand. Jesus does for us what nobody else can do. This is the only name through which He extends salvation. Then I want to ask one more question. How then should we respond to that name? First of all, I think the Bible makes it clear that we should praise His name, that the praise of God ought to be on our lips and on our mouth constantly. The Scripture says in Psalm 96, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless His name and proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. We praise Him by singing. 
We did it this morning. But please don't get so used to singing the words again and again and again that we forget the meaning of what we're singing about, uh, that we are not just singing words. We're singing it to Him as an act of worship, uh, as an act of praise. We should speak in His name. Uh, the Scripture says in Psalm 103, bless the Lord and forget not all of His benefits. Uh, constantly be telling people of what God is doing in your life. The most positive witness you can give to somebody is not just badgering them to make a decision, but letting them know what God has done for you. And when they see the grace of God at work in your life, then they begin to have a desire to have that same experience for themselves. Ephesians 5.19 says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. And we praise Him by serving Him. Psalm 23 or 34.3 Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. Uh, The Scripture says in uh, serving the Lord in the book of Joshua, as for me and my house, we will do what? Serve the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 46, blessed is that servant who when his master comes will find him so doing. Doing what? Serving him. We praise His name And then we respond to His name by praying in His name. We call on the name of the Lord. Most of you know that verse, Romans 10, 13. It actually quotes a passage from the Old Testament. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's not just saying certain words that bring about salvation. It's the cry of the soul. It's the call of the heart. It's the response of faith. Yes, I really believe Jesus is who He said He was. He can do what He said He can do. He can do it for me, and I'm putting my eternal destiny in His hands, and I'm calling on Him to be my Savior. We call on His name. We confess His name. The Scripture tells us that if we confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God, and He in us. We publicly acknowledge it. We're not secret agent Christians. Too many Christians today are going into the closet while everybody else is coming out of the closet. Uh, We need to stand up for what we believe, and we need to speak up for what we believe, and we need to confess it. We need to cast all of our troubles on His name. For be anxious for nothing, Philippians 4 says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard or protect your hearts and minds through who? Christ Jesus. And then we should commit ourselves totally to Him in our act of worship. Revelation 4.10, the 24 elders in the book of Revelation fall down before Him who sits on the throne. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O Lord. Uh, They ascribe the worthiness, the worshipfulness of God the Father in Revelation 4 and God the Son in Revelation 5, and they sing a new song unto Jesus, the Lamb of God, worthy is the Lamb, worthy, worthy, worthy. In the original language of the New Testament in Greek, that word worthy is axios. Why is He worthy? Because He is holy. And in Greek, it's a very similar word, agios. They look alike almost. It's a deliberate play or connection on the two words. That which is axios, 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 worthy of our worship is that which is hagios, 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 that which is holy, holy, holy. If you missed last week's powerful opening to Why is the Name of Jesus so important? Or if you'd like a copy to keep and share with your friends, this message is available in its entirety on CD for a gift of $10 or more and on DVD for a gift of $20 or more. Make your gift payable to The King is Coming, Box 907, Colton, California, 92324. To use your credit card, call 800-622-2767 or go to thekingiscoming.com. Uh, When was the last time you had a deep, moving experience of worship and response to God just because of who He is, just because of what His name is? So I want to challenge us this morning. Uh, Many of us have something we ought to be praising Him about, 
And I want to encourage you to come and praise Him today and thank Him. Some of us are facing difficult challenges. We need God to come down. We need an answer to our prayers. We need some divine intervention in our lives, and we need to come and pray. If you've come to the service and you've never come to faith in Christ, the invitation's open to do that. Uh, If you've come to join this church and be part of this family, you can come and do that. But for most of us, the invitation is simple. Some of us need to come and praise. Some of us need to come and pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Father, this morning, I pray that You might challenge us where we need to be challenged, that You might encourage us where we need to be encouraged. And God, I pray that You would be pleased with the response of the worship of our hearts this morning. Some of us are so grateful for all that You've done for us beyond anything we deserve. And this morning, we want to say, thank you, thank you, thank you, praise you, praise you, praise you. Let me ask you again, how many have something to praise the Lord about this morning? Let me see your hand. Then the invitation ought to be real simple. Then come and do it. I'm going to open the time of prayer to say, let's come and praise Him and thank Him. How many of you are facing a tough challenge and you really need God's help with something? Let me see your hand again. Then let's come and pray. The pastors will be here to meet you at the front. If you need somebody to pray with you, they will. But if you want to come and call on the Lord, just do it. So let's stand together quietly and prayerfully. The piano will play. And uh, in a moment, we'll sing a song that I think is very appropriate to the message today. And uh, if you've got something to praise the Lord about, just come right now. He says, well, that I'm in the middle of a row. Just say, excuse me, and step out and come. If you're upstairs, come on down the side. And if you've got something you want to pray about, come on right now. Come on. God bless you. Just come. Amen. Just step out and come. Just step out and come. God, I've got something I'm so grateful for this morning. I just don't want to leave without taking time to really thank you. And if you want to come and kneel, you're welcome to do that. If you want to come and stand, you're welcome to do that as well. If you have a decision to make of some sort, pastors will be here. Let them know that as you come. If you want somebody to pray with you, let them know that as well.